Good hope. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, um, as Ian was just saying, I'm going to be talking about, a, if you like, a subset of the sort of projects which um, Dave was just describing. And this is analysis of broadcast science uh, as a project. So, just to say where I'm hoping to go in the next 15 minutes, uh, talk a little bit about the rationale for media projects, and then introduce people to the, to the uh, Bob tool, sometimes known as Box of Broadcasts, uh, because um, I, I was asked to explain that in slightly more detail because many people are still not aware of its existence. I'm going to talk a bit as well about the Television Radio Index for Learning and Teaching, which is a natural companion to Bob, and then just talk through some of the possible methodologies and limitations, and if time allows, just mention one other additional use of broadcast media in this whole realm of kind of dry labs, real science. Okay, so in terms of the rationale, uh, content analysis of newspapers, for example, is a well-known, a well-established method of research in the social sciences. And there are various databases that can be used for that. There's something called Nexus, something else called Factiva. And just in passing, you could actually get students to do projects using those media, using those particular databases. Most libraries have access uh, to those. I'm going to talk more about Bob, though, which is this uh, more recent tool which enables you to look at both TV and radio broadcasts. It does allow you then to do a systematic review of those media, and it's useful for developing uh, student skills in science communication and media analysis. So uh, Bob then, as I say, sometimes called Box of Broadcasts. It was actually called Bob first before it was called Box of Broadcasts. And that was in homage to Bob, the character from Blackadder. Uh, and uh, Box of Broadcast was fixed to that afterwards. The current management of learning on screen don't like the name Box of Broadcast as much, but I think it kind of describes what it is. So I do still use that a bit. And I've put there the URL for, uh, for Bob. So what is it? Uh, so this is a collection now of more than 2 million TV and radio recordings. Uh, they're available to be streamed to universities, to member institutions, and they come from more than 65 different channels. And the primary vision for this was actually as a teaching resource, and many of us I know already use this in teaching in different ways. But what I'm hoping to demonstrate now is that there's growing potential for this to be used for research purposes as well. A couple of bits of background information to add to that, which will be important in the later discussion. One is that since the 1st of August 2016, the core channels, which are uh, BBC One, BBC Two, uh, Channel Four, Channel Five, More Four, BBC Four, Radio Four and Radio Four Extra, those are recorded now by default into the system. Prior to that, and for the remaining channels can, uh, currently, there is a on-demand system. So people would have to request something to be kept in the Bob system. Um, all staff, all students at uh, all member institutions have a right to order up to 10 things a day if they wanted to do so. And um, once those are in the system, they're then available for everybody else as well. There's a 30 day window, normally currently 40 days, in, in which you can order something after it's been broadcast. Uh, so if you happen to become aware that something very useful appeared last week, you can order that into the system. So I'm going to walk you into the Bob system. I'm not going to, um, in terms of time constraints, not going to risk anything snarling up here. So I'm going to, to take some screenshots, uh, to take through some screenshots. Uh, so this would be the, the sign-in uh, homepage when you got to it. Obviously, there's the, the sign-in button. And if you click that, you then need to type in the name of your institution. There is a slight quirk here. I'm not quite sure why this is, but if you were to type, in my case, University of Leicester, its entirety into the box, it wouldn't recognize it. You have to select it from the list that appears below. So that's just something to bear in mind. The first time you go, and I believe there's a couple of other checks that you need to do when you first arrive, but once you've become familiar with the system, you would land at a home page that's your page that looks something like this. And we'll notice there are uh, some buttons at the top here on the purple bar, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, but then there are three sections within the My Bob section. There's requests, the programs that you've ordered to be recorded into the system. Then there's playlists, and then there's clips. So playlists, you can add anything that's in the system already or any clips that you make 
to as many playlists as you like. So some people kind of advocate a one program, one playlist model. I would disagree with that. I think the whole purpose of playlists is to enable you to rediscover materials later for colleagues and other institutions to be able to rediscover things. So for that reason as well, I keep my playlist public, whereas you can make them private. And then the ability to make clips. I'm not going to talk about that in any detail really today, but just to be aware that you can make clips from programs. So it might be a particular section out of a documentary that you wanted to use in a teaching context or uh, in the examples that are on the screen here. These are um, short sections from news programs or from BBC Click which are relevant to a particular story. So you can clip, clip out just the relevant four minutes, six minutes or, or, or whatever from the, from the relevant program. Bouncing up to that top control bar, there is the guide and it's a, a fairly standard GUI interface there. Um, so the channels, which are the core channels, appear at the top of the list. And this was where now was when I did this particular screen grab. The top channels here will be recorded in by default uh, later in the day. But supposing you happen to be watching the Victoria Derbyshire show and you suddenly thought there's something really excellent there that relates to my teaching, you could click request program even though it's going to be in the system anyway because then that will send you an email to alert you to the existence of a, a particular um, that particular program so scrolling down that uh, we would then come alphabetically to the rest of the channels just a note in passing Al Jazeera has some excellent science on it uh, some really good programs like the cure which are very good and then scrolling on down um, you would eventually get down to Sky News which is also in the system uh, it's the only Sky Channel, I think, that's represented there. Some of my students were disappointed when they first discovered about Bob to realise they couldn't get Game of Thrones as part of their, their studies. OK, and then the search facility. This is a screen grab of the search tool within Bob. Uh, I'll talk about the search tool within Trilt in a moment. Uh, but just you can see there the various fields that you could select. So. Um, whether you're going to include everything, including transcripts, which I would recommend that you do. Uh, could be choosing particular channels or TV only, radio only, and so on, and then setting a time window. Okay, so it may be that you've not heard about Bob at all until now, and you think, well, what, what can I do if I haven't got Bob? My first answer is that you probably do. Uh, there's a very large percentage of universities uh, in the UK that have membership of the, of the Bob system, um, but very few academics that know about it. So there, there's a, a bit of a mismatch there. So almost certainly you do. And so the first thing to do would be to, to try and see whether you type in your university uh, address and see whether things come up. If you genuinely don't, there is a free trial on at the moment until the 31st of July, and uh, you would email bob at learningonscreen.ac.uk for that. If even at the end of the day, you, you still don't have access to Bob. The kind of things I'm going to be talking about could be applied to, for example, YouTube videos or um, TED Talks specifically, something of, of that sort. However, there are advantages to Bob, which I hope to demonstrate, which I think make it a better source than those particular options. Okay, so what is it then I think that makes Bob particularly useful for this type of research? Well, some of those are items that we mentioned previously, the size of the collection, more than 2 million different programs available, free access to member HEIs, and anything within the system is copyright cleared. Now that's not quite as important for research as it is for teaching, but nonetheless, it is true. And what this produces is what I term a boundaried collection. So you've got a, uh, a body of material which you can interrogate using uh, different approaches and then to pull out materials from there. Uh, in the assurance that other people can also look at that same collection of resources. And then also not to um, underestimate the importance of dovetailing this with this second resource, which is TRILT, the Television and Radio Index for Learning and Teaching. Both of these are developed by Learning on Screen. Okay, so Bob and TRILT, although they, they come from the same stable, they have slightly different methodologies and therefore slightly different strengths and weaknesses when it comes to thinking about research on broadcast media. Both would happily pick up titles of programmes, for example, but Bob also has this ability to look at transcripts for programmes. Now, I'll come back to transcripts in a moment. 
That can be particularly helpful, for example, if the project that you wanted to, to work through with students involved looking at news content, uh, because that won't be picked up in Trilt. On the other hand, Trilt has more metadata overall, including a, a synoptic description of the program, which you wouldn't get necessarily from Bob, and it is available for a, for a wider time window, going back longer in time than, than Bob. So here's the names of some uh, example projects. Um, so um, these are projects which students of mine have done over the last few years. Uh, how accurate is the presentation of Alzheimer's disease in broadcast media? <clears throat> Representations of personalized media in broadcast, uh, personalized medicine, sorry, in broadcast media, an ethical perspective. Does broadcast media give an accurate representation of the science regarding the role of exercise in prevention of cardiovascular disease? Scientific and um, broadcast media representations of the gay gene and representation of medical cannabis in broadcast media. So I should emphasize that I'm always very keen that students own their own projects. And so these are all topics that these particular students chose to look at. They're things that possibly dovetail with their other modules that they're taking in the final year, but also for what other, other reasons, maybe something that's of particular interest to them. So it is their project which they're doing with my assistants. Just going to walk you through a typical methodology, and these have been evolving over these last uh, three or four years when I've had students working on projects of this kind. And so you would start off by doing a fairly typical literature review, one of the purposes of which in this case would be to generate keywords. You're then taking those keywords and you can apply them in, uh, to searches either in Bob or in Trilt as well. And the remaining couple of slides here, I'm going to walk us through what a Trilt search might look like. So this is the Trilt search box here on the right hand side. And you can set various criteria. You could show only the latest broadcast. You could set it to show available on Bob only. So things which are already in the Bob system, that would be a useful way of constraining material. But for some cases, you might want to have a longer range. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Trilt has a longer time frame than some of the others. So for the student who's working on the gay gene, um, he, um, actually didn't constrain it to Bob, he was able to look further back and find other materials that could also be drawn into the, into the search. One advantage of Trilt is it gives every program an ID code. So you can do a first screen through, choose appropriate programs. You can then uh, remove duplicates. So if you had, for example, more than one different keyword that you've been using, you might find that you've got um, several programs represented more than once. So you could knock those out. Also, secondly, um, the sign zone version, so that the nighttime signed versions of programs often have their own separate Trilt ID code. So you could be reducing the collection from those. And then do a bit of a stock check. How many programs are represented at this stage? For most of the projects, there's still an awful lot of material at this stage. So you might want then to, to apply some other constraints. Uh, for example, looking at the synopsis of the program, uh, is it clearly actually not relevant, even though the keyword made it look like it was. You could constrain the date range that you're looking at. You could, you could look at just TV or just radio. Uh, you could perhaps choose particular channels or look to be combining more than one keyword into any one search. You can then output material uh, by using the mark facility within the, um, the, the software and then at that point, you would then look in more detail at those particular programs, watch them, listen to them, perhaps read a transcript. Again, remove things which don't fit the uh, criteria for the project. And then you're into your kind of more thorough analysis, re-watching and making transcripts of the final selection and doing some content analysis to build towards the project. Just briefly, uh, limitations. I did mention this is a boundary collection. It's not complete. Remember I said that not everything is recorded in by default. Uh, so there will be some things that wouldn't necessarily be there, but I think nonetheless it is a, um, things that are there are not gonna get taken away. So it does represent a useful collection of materials. That does mean, however, that I would see this more as a qualitative evaluation in the first instance. I would be very reticent about students saying, for example, the BBC shows more programs on Alzheimer's disease than ITV does, because there are differences in the, in the way in which data gets entered into that. What you could say is within the sample period that we looked at, 
there was more programs on this channel than that channel, but I, I would be slightly cautious about going too far down that route. Okay, um, I mentioned that uh, there are other potential uses. This is uh, using a clip from a terrible science program within uh, Box of Broadcast. It was an episode of Brainiac as the basis for then doing an activity on experimental design. So that's something that we do with our first year students. Uh, I'll leave the, the information there. I, I've, um, I've made these slides available already. Uh, just thanks in passing to two of the students who've done a particularly good job in developing the methodology. That's Holly Large, who's actually gonna be starting a PhD on this type of analysis with me in September, and uh, Emma Seale, one of the current uh, uh, finalists. Uh, those are my contact details, and uh, I'll throw that open to questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Every time you speak, I always learn something new from you. So um, I've picked up a whole new Bless idea you, of things you do. So thank you very much. Um, we've had a couple of questions come through. At least um, one, and it's quite a lot of them about the analysis and about how the analysis of yeah. the uh, the programming works. So the, there was one question from Ian. Uh, I'll read it out. It says, "How does one measure the accuracy of media quality in a quantitative way?" But I think within that. If you could elaborate on how you do your qualitative analysis, I think that'll probably help answer that question. Yes. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think the, 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 the last point I made there may actually then um, kind of limit the discussion in terms of the quantitative. I will, I will be very cautious about some of the quantitative uh, analysis um, unless it was, you know, looking at a particular defined subset and saying within that uh, collection, um, you know how many programs have shown a particular sort in terms of the qualitative analysis i mean i think this is where it's important that not only are students engaging with the literature to generate the keywords in the first place but they're then looking at what they've found and checking validity back against the science at that stage so that's a an ongoing iterative process as they look and see what was shown uh how does that then fit uh with with, with the um published science and doing a comparison there and so um, for example, the uh, Alzheimer's disease project, you know, looked at six different aspects of ways in which the disease was, was represented and, and critiqued those uh, separately and did a very nice job of, of looking at that. So, so typically, how much media does a student have to engage with to generate a big enough data set for this? I mean, I'm thinking of screen time hours and yeah, yeah. Know, textual. Again, Thank yeah. you. So it depends a bit on what type of thing they're looking at. So, for example, if they're looking at uh, something that involves um, a number of, you know, well-crafted documentaries, for example, then clearly there may be an hour each uh, in terms of the analysis. But um, equally, or the flip side of that rather, is that those programs are then more likely to have a long transcript available that you can use um, for for the analysis. I would say. A thorough um, final collection would be probably about 40 or 50 programs. Um, I think less than that is likely to be uh, not properly reflective, and more than that, it's just not realistic. So starting searches often end up with something in the low hundreds, and then it's a question of tweaking those down, uh, for example, by setting a, a, a time window. So uh, we have, for example, quite often taken that date in 2016 as the earliest date, for a search and kept to those core channels because then um, we know that material is, is pretty thoroughly covered in that particular set. Al Jazeera, unfortunately, for example, uh, doesn't, have doesn't have subtitles. The transcripts are developed from the subtitling, so it's harder to pick up on that material randomly in a search process. So I've probably got time for one more question before we hand over to Nigel. Um, Elliot asked, "How accurate in, is the media reporting in science? Uh, the media <laughs> in reporting science is it likely that students will pick up mistakes and be able to critique them?" Yeah. So um, again, th there's a very variable picture of things out there, but they very definitely are able to spot um, mistakes in some things, and in, in some senses, some quite uh, nuanced discussions. Uh, again, the Alzheimer's one was particularly good uh, at looking at that. Um, yeah, just coming back to the, your previous point, actually, in terms of the limitations of material, the, the one this most recent year on, on looking at evidence for a, whether or not there's a gay gene, um, that 
actually started, we had a relatively small data set, so he ended up including pretty much everything that he'd found. The other projects tend to involve trimming down quite dramatically what we found to a, 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 um, an appropriate sample. Fantastic. How are we doing for time, Nigel? I've got a few more questions coming through, but... Yeah, I can go for another one if you want. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, um, how do you go about referencing these materials? And somebody says, is it correct you can research back to the 1920s? Not somebody, says, Gerard says, is it correct you can research back to the 1920s? Okay. Good, good. So uh, the two separate questions there. First of all, referencing. There is a standard methodology for referencing. So um, um, the, there is a, a guide for AV citation, which has, has now had two editions produced. So that gives guidance on, on um, the, the criteria that should be included, and also the various different formats that Harvard or, or um, uh, all the, I forget what the other ones are called now, but the different styles, uh, it, it has kind of guidance for all of those different systems. The 1923 is interesting. So uh, clearly there's not things with um, video available for all of those, uh, but actually the um, Trilt database includes a whole variety of other sources that go into there. So I think 1923 was the start of the Radio Times. So there are some programs which are there merely as a listing. Uh, so the details of a program that, as it was described in the Radio Times or the TV Times, or um, there's actually a separate collection of everything that was ever on Channel 4. And they used to produce a weekly magazine to do with the Channel 4 programming that also all of that metadata has been entered into the system um, so that's why the date goes back that far um, Bob goes back less far and kind of active availability of video would be uh, I guess from the, the 1990s by default in in um, Trilt although uh, I didn't mention in passing there is actually a relationship with the BBC which means that things that are older than the Bob system can be called in um, so um, that normally costs you some of your institutional allowance. Uh, member universities have a certain number of recordings per year that they can request. And so I recently uh, had imported some of the episodes of Local Heroes, uh, which if you remember that the Adam Hart Davis science series from the 1990s. Uh, there are some excellent demonstrations in there. So I was um, uh, keen to get some of those into the system. So we use some of our institutional allowance to, to add those. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, excellent. Um, we'll collate all of your links together and put them into the, the resource pack along with your slides. And Dustin's also been posting quite a few papers up in the chat as we're going along. So I'll try and grab those or maybe even ask Dustin very nicely if he'll put them into the resource for us. So thank you once again.